Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for the Thursday COVID-19 uh, situational report. Uh, happy August. Uh, my name is Brittany Cadence. I'm the communications manager here at Peterborough Public Health, and it's our pleasure to welcome you uh, today to, so we can provide you with uh, the latest information about the COVID-19 outbreak in our community. Um, as we uh, gather, let's take a moment to pause and reflect. So we, we, we do respectfully acknowledge that Peterborough Public Health is located on the Treaty 20 Michisagic territory and in the traditional territory of the Michisagic and Chippewa nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaty's First Nations, which include Curve Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, Rama, Beausole, and Georgina Island First Nations. Peterborough Public Health respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty's First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. We are all treaty people. That's the pink sky, you don't need anything there. Okay, I'm just going to uh, mute a few participants. Um, while, so with that, I would like to invite our Board of Health Chair, uh, Mayor Andy Mitchell from Selwyn Township to begin us off with a few opening remarks. Please go ahead, Andy. Thank you, Brittany. Uh, throughout the province and here locally, we continue to make good progress in achieving the inoculation goals of 80% first dose and 75% second dose. Achieving these objectives will trigger the plan to leave step three and to reduce the number of public health restrictions in place. I want to congratulate all those who have stepped up and taken the vaccine. It is making a positive difference as demonstrated in the reduced case counts in our area. I also want to recognize the staff at Peterborough Public Health and all those who have contributed to delivering the vaccine in the Peterborough region. This has been a community effort including both professional staff and volunteers who have stepped up and made it happen. It demonstrates what we can do when we all work together. It is important, however, to remember that the job is not complete and the risk of COVID-19 continues. Variants of concern continue to circulate and people continue to be infected. The ongoing impacts of COVID can be seen across many jurisdictions around the world especially where vaccination rates are low. Although we have done well with the vaccine rollout, we urgently need to complete the job. Peterborough Public Health is launching a number of creative approaches to bring the vaccine to the community and make it as easy as possible to get your shot. Please take advantage of the next opportunity available. Everyone know that vaccines work, that they save lives, and that they protect you, your family, and your community. Please get your shot and then your second. Your community needs your help. Stay safe, be well, and in all things, be kind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Mitchell. Okay, joining us now is Dr. Rosanna Salvaterra, our Medical Officer of Health, to walk us through the latest slides. Please go through, go ahead, Dr. Salvaterra. Thank you, Brittany, and thank you, Mayor Mitchell. I'll start with a situational update. Uh, and you can see uh, that we have currently four active cases with only five close contacts that we are following. Uh, these are the lowest numbers we've seen in a while. And so uh, some additional good news is that we have not had a new case reported to us since July 30th. Our next uh, slide, gives you our weekly case counts, uh, and they do remain low. But last week we saw another increase. We were back to double digits after two weeks of very low numbers. I mean, it does show you how tenuous all of this is. Uh, but as far as this week goes, so far we have no new cases reported. So fingers crossed. Next slide, please. On the left, you can see that we are slightly, uh, we have slightly more men than women who have tested positive for COVID-19 in Peterborough. 
Uh, the bar graph, we're showing you the age groups of our new cases uh, over the past four weeks. Uh, and you can see that those under 29 uh, years of age represented most of the new cases uh, reported to us. However, I think it's interesting also to note that the 50 to 59 year age group also showed a higher number of cases and that this is also one of those age groups with slightly lower vaccination rates. And I'll show you those in just a moment. Next slide, please. I'm pleased to report that we have currently no active COVID outbreaks in our community. And here on the next slide, I can show you our weekly case incidence rate as it compares to the rest of the province. Uh, we're looking green, Peterborough, which is good. Uh, starting on the right slide, side of the slide, you can see the weekly case incidence rates. Uh, for the period of uh, ending July 31st, uh, our uh, case incidence rate rose to 9.5 cases per 100,000, and that was up from the previous week where we were at 3.4. Um, I, I will point out that our rate is roughly the same as our provincial weekly incidence rate. It's, it's sitting at 9.1 cases per 100,000. Um, hopefully, we'll see uh, our uh, this week's case incidence rate drop following this current five-day stretch with no new cases. Uh, as you can see on this map, which gives us the case incidence rates over the past 14 days, Peterborough is in green. Uh, those areas on the map that are currently showing up in yellow and orange represent those Delta variant hotspots. Uh, and you can see that our neighboring public health uh, unit appears to have experienced a slightly higher case incidence rate uh, over the past two weeks, and it's shown in yellow. Next slide, please. Here we have our wastewater surveillance data just in this morning, uh, and it continues to be very encouraging. The red bars represent the uh, Peterborough wastewater facility uh, treatment uh, site, and the blue bars are Millbrook. Uh, and uh, you can see that the city continues with very low levels being detected, but you will also note that we are seeing uh, increased levels of virus uh, in the wastewater in Millbrook, and that does indeed correspond with a number of active cases in that area. We'll move on to immunization. And uh, here is the data at end of day yesterday. The pace of vaccinations has tapered off. Last week, 700 more Peterborough residents received their first dose and just over 2,400 had their second dose. Uh, but I think that also reflects the fact that our Evan Rood Clinic was closed for four days over the long weekend as we moved back from the arena into the banquet hall. So we had we had a big move and they have settled in now again in those multi-purpose rooms. If we look at, to, uh, at these half circle charts uh, and on the far right, uh, you can see, uh, sorry, on the far left, you can see that uh, almost 80% of our eligible residents have now had their first dose and almost 70% uh, have had their second dose. So that's great progress, Peterborough, uh, but it's certainly not enough yet to protect us against the Delta uh, variants. Um, you can uh, see on the right hand that the vaccination rates among eligible youth aged 12 to 17 uh, are continuing to increase, so that's great. Uh, we have almost half of that age group now fully immunized. It's at 47%, up from 43% last week, and we uh, hope to see this continue to increase as the school year draws near. We'll look at the next slide. 
Uh, and here uh, we can we see the uh, percentage of first and second doses by age. So you can see that that 50 to 59 year group um, is lagging behind. Um, and certainly I would say that all of those age bands below 59 years of age are not at the levels that we need to see uh, and would definitely like to see. Um, and uh, but uh, that our elder, our older population, pardon me, are uh, are certainly well protected. So that's great to see. On the next slide, we'll see how our vaccination stacks up to the rest uh, for our community as a whole to the rest of the province. Now, this is where um, we look at our total population, and that includes children who aren't able to be immunized. Last week, we uh, inched very uh, up slightly with 70.3% of the total population now fully, uh, now vaccinated with one dose and almost 62% of our full population with a second dose. And this map from August 4th uh, shows that we are keeping pace with our uh, our sister health units, uh, and that in the in terms of full population, most parts of the province are now sitting at about uh, 50 to 60 percent coverage rates. Overall, we still have more work to do. We have about uh, 13,800 of our Peterborough residents who are eligible for vaccine and we need them to be immunized to get to that 90% of local vaccination rate, that herd or community uh, immunity that we so uh, much need. We'll look uh, at our final slide today, which I wanted to share with you. And this is an analysis of our recent cases by their vaccination status. Uh, and this to me is a powerful indicator of how effectively our vaccines are protecting our community. When we look at our 45 cases uh, in July of this year, we can see that not a single one was someone who was fully immunized. That, that is very encouraging. Uh, remembering that it takes two weeks after the second dose for the vaccine to take full effect, you can see that 11 cases were uh, people who um, did not, uh, were partially protected. They had their one dose, but not yet their second. You can see another five were people who were immunized, but it was too soon, uh, had no protection. Uh, and then uh, 65, almost 65% of our cases were people that were not immunized at all. So this chart clearly shows that the more vaccinated you are, the more protection you will enjoy and the safer our community becomes. Uh, as we've been hearing that this has now become a pandemic of the unvaccinated, and this certainly seems to be the case here locally as well. So I'll make a few additional remarks before introducing our special guest today. Uh, it's Vax to School Day time. Uh, it was great to see students walking in with or without their parents yesterday uh, at the Evinrude while I was there getting their first and their second doses of the COVID vaccine. With school starting in just five weeks, there is still time to get both doses before that school bell rings, although full protection won't come into effect until two weeks following that second dose. So my message to students and families and all school staff is please take advantage of our walk-in COVID-19 vaccination clinics today or as soon as possible as part of your back to school preparations. We all know that school is critical for students. And now with the reopening guidance, we are starting to get a better sense of what to expect. I do hope that most students uh, will be back in the classroom in September, but I understand that families will have a choice and that for some virtual learning will make the most sense. 
However, parents do now have the opportunity to prepare those children that will be returning to the classroom uh, on the uh, certainly uh, teaching them the importance of wearing masks indoors or on school buses, uh, of hand washing and of physical distancing even when outside at recess. Parents, students and staff all have a role to play in preventing COVID transmission. And the first step is that completing that daily screening every morning. I can't emphasize strongly enough how important it is to stay home when unwell. This is really the first line of defense after immunization for uh, those uh, students and staff who will be in the classroom. And it really is critical when thinking of all those younger children under the age of 12 who are not eligible for vaccination yet. Uh, being fully immunized will bring benefits to both staff and students who will potentially be able to stay in the classroom and not face uh, possible dismissal in relation to a school-based case. Uh, fully immunized students and staff can still attend school when a household member is sick and awaiting testing results. They can participate in sports and extracurricular activities with an added sense an added sense of confidence in, in their protection. Uh, so please, Peterborough, uh, let's prepare for a successful school year by making immunization part of the plan. I want to emphasize how much of a risk the Delta variant now plays in Ontario. And here in Peterborough, both uh, of our cases that were genomically sequenced last week were Delta variants. Um, we are talking about a, a virus that is twice as infectious as the version that circulated here last summer. Once infected, median, median viral loads are 1,000 times higher than in the original virus. Uh, without public health measures in place, that means that we're looking at a reproductive rate of seven. So that means that for every one person who's inf infected, another seven will be infected. And that reproductive number comes down to two when we have 80% of our population fully immunized. So it's still not low enough to prevent outbreaks and ongoing transmission and a reason why those public health measures will be needed in the fall uh, until we can get to that 90% of, of our community that's immunized. The Delta variant does have a shorter incubation period. It causes more severe disease. Other jurisdictions like the UK are seeing growing numbers of ICU admissions once more. So we are by no means out of the woods yet, uh, but with immunization and careful ob ob observance of masking and distancing, we can enjoy the summer and the fall and all the pleasures of being able to connect in person and to enjoy some of our favorite activities. And speaking of favorite activities, I can't think of a more beloved sport in Peterborough than hockey. Uh, I would like to introduce Burton Lee, Executive Director of Business Operations with the Peterborough Peets, to share some details about an exciting new partnership designed to increase our local immunization rates. So over to you, please, Burton. Thank you, Dr. Salvatera. I, I have to give credit for, first of all, an amazing pun, back to school. I'm, I'm here for that type of content every day. And, and what a great smooth segue into talking about hockey and our Get a Shot to Take a Shot campaign. Uh, before I go into the details, congratulations to you, Dr. Salvatera, and your team. I know there's many members of your direct and extended team uh, contributed to the leadership uh, that have led to the results that, that you presented with the SIT report earlier today. Uh, great stuff, and, and certainly we're all hoping for the, continue, sorry, the continuation of that. At the start of the call, the Honorable Ma Andy Mitchell mentioned two words, community and teamwork, and those are foundational values of the Peets dating back to 1956 when we were founded. And, you know, really beyond all else, else those are two things that we value. And 
our fans, our team members, our staff, and the overall community have told us over and over for the past several months, well over a year, that they want and need two things. COVID to get under control and hockey to return. And that would be, in our minds, the biggest blockbuster trade of the century if we could swap the pandemic for Pete's hockey coming back to our community. With close to 3,500 fans in each game, 100,000 fans in attendance at our games every single year, um, we don't take lightly the fact that our community wants and in a lot of cases needs to gather at our games for, for a, a variety. For this to happen, we need to get COVID under control, uh, which is a large part part of the reason why the Pete's are excited to partner with Peter Rowe Public Health on a get a shot to take a shot. I'll run through a few details of this campaign that we're really excited about. Um, in general, the campaign offers anyone who receives a COVID-19 vaccine dose between this upcoming Monday, August 9th, and Thursday, September 30th, at a clinic run by PPH, the PRHC, or local pharmacy, the chance to win a pair of tickets to a Pete's home game during the upcoming 2021-2022 season. Those who receive their first or second vaccine dose during this time period will be provided with a QR code at, at their VAC site to enter the Get a Shot to Take a Shot contest. On September 30th, a virtual draw will take place where 250 people who received one or two of their doses uh, of the COVID-19 vaccine and enter the contest will be pulled. So a total of 500 tickets will be awarded. People who received first and second doses of the VAX during that uh, contest period can enter. So of those ticket winners, we're excited to say that five will be randomly drawn for an opportunity to shoot the puck in the net from center ice during the first intermission of one of our home games this season. And then the winner of that shootout will then get to enjoy an additional Pete's home game with their friends and family in one of the private executive signal centers. So hence the name, get a shot to take a shot. We are hoping to encourage as many people as possible who haven't yet to get their first and or second doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. And we look forward to providing a little bit of a carrot to do so, getting back to Pete's Hockey this fall with our home opener set for October 14th here at the Memorial Center. And, uh, and a few even luckier participants will get a chance to, to shoot into the net and I think in many cases fulfill a, any Peterborough's dream to, to take a shot and score on the Pete's net during a Pete's home game. Thank you so much, Burton. And we are so excited to partner with you and uh, and uh, work with the Peets to encourage as much of, of a vaccine uptake as we can to get us to this this last goal. And uh, we we it's been a pleasure working with you and your team. So uh, thank you for everything. And we uh, hopefully you'll you'll stay on the call in case there's any questions from our media partners at the end. Um, but before we get to that, I would like to uh, welcome some of our elected officials who have kindly joined us today and uh, to see if they have any remarks they'd like to share. Uh, I believe our uh, MP, uh, Mary Monsap, is with us today. So, Miriam, if you have any uh, qu comments, please go right ahead. Thank you so much, Brittany. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Perfect. Hello, everybody. Bonjour, Anin. Salam alaikum. I join you from my home on Mitchisagi and Schnabek territory. And I'll start with, you know, the super nerd in me. So very much appreciates the alliteration and the Peterborough Peets and public health, Peterborough Public Health Partnership. I think it's brilliant. And as one of the cabinet ministers on the federal COVID committee. I applaud the creativity and the partnership that has brought this exciting initiative to finish the job in our community to the foreground. I look forward to that first game and I look forward to getting our numbers to where they need to be so that everybody's safe. I'll begin my comments uh, and update with some gratitude, speak about the unfinished business and the work ahead. If this summer feels better than last summer, it's because, as Andy Mitchell, the Honorable Andy Mitchell said, it has been a Team Canada approach these past 512 days. And it's been because of the steady hands of the chair of our public health, Andy, the brilliant Rosanna Salvatera, and the entire team in public health, on the front lines, in healthcare, in essential sectors, 
and those who made sacrifices and those who have rolled up their sleeves to get the shot. I'm grateful to be a Canadian and to be in this enviable position at this stage in the pandemic. I'm grateful for the opportunity I had to thank personally some of the 400 plus volunteers and workers at the Evan Root Center yesterday. You know, I, I as a born and raised, uh, you know, uh, super nerd, it's always nice to be able to see, you know, the vial of vaccine up close and see the people who move it forward. As someone who has many fun memories at the Evan Root Center, whether it was the Cyber Zone dances as a teenager, the hockey games, the first Eid dinner I, I hosted with our team there at Trent University, the you know family gatherings, the political rallies, the first town hall I hosted was at the Evan Root. By far, that tour of gratitude yesterday at the Evan Root Center, now with a fancy new name, has been one of the most special memories I have of that place. I can honestly say that it was the happiest place on earth. To the volunteers and to staff who with good cheer and great efficiency are running such smart clinics to make sure that everybody who wants a vaccine gets it, I'm grateful to you. To those of you who came out of retirement, to those of you who are working two, three other jobs and studying and still stepping up, to your families for sharing you, I am so deeply grateful. I'll also take this opportunity to thank my team. They've been essential for this community's response to COVID as liaison with Ottawa and as conveners locally. The team worked from home. That meant I could see their kids online learning while they were on Zoom calls with me. They went through grieving processes when they were lost loved ones or had to care for ill parents and deal with the anxieties of the pandemic. And still some 3,000, somewhere between 2,000 to 3,000 individuals reached out to my office and my brilliant team responded with grace and compassion. And I'm grateful for them because they held me up. On the unfinished business, those 13,800 unvaccinated community members, we need your help to step up, to roll up your sleeve, to get your first shot and to get your second shot so that the rest of our community, particularly those who are most vulnerable, including our children, are safe. So that when they go back to school, they can breathe a sigh of relief. My 12-year-old niece got her vaccine and my five-year-old niece pretended like she was getting hers. She threw a tantrum actually when she realized she couldn't get one because she understood that her life is not going to be okay until everybody's safe. Please step up. These vaccines are free. They're available and smart, lovely people are there to administer them for you. The message I got from the folks I spoke with yesterday was clear. Get your shot. This is our chance. Get your shot so that Canada can step up, help the rest of the world, but also respond to the other crises that are already at our doorstep. From, from climate change to reconciliation to equity and racism, we have a lot of work to do and we need to put this pandemic behind us. Dr. Salvatera, once more. If we're in good shape here locally, if we've been able to pivot, it has a lot to do with your leadership. And I am so grateful to have watched you do this and to have played a small part in it all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Miriam, for sharing those comments today. Uh, okay, joining us from the county, uh, I see County Warden Jones on the line. And uh, if you got, have your camera on and have some remarks to share, please go right ahead, Warden Jones. Okay, well, thank you very much. I hope uh, everyone can hear me. Thanks for having me again. It won't be too long. Uh, hope we're all enjoying a lovely summer's day out there. I think I mentioned last time that the county was uh, was saying a great big thank you to the gang out of Fairhaven, and we did that last week, and uh, it went over very, very well. Some very dedicated people out there, and the county were very happy to to give them a, a special 
Thank you. So we at the county, we are uh, in the process of planning to return to the offices, uh, even return to the council chambers. We hope in the fall, if everything uh, stays the way it is, and we keep doing the right things, so we look forward to that. And we're certainly continue to be so thankful for everyone out there, the health unit gang and our public works crews and our paramedics and our hospital workers. It's just uh, just amazing. And I, I'm very impressed with this Pete's promotion. I think it's a great, great idea. Burton, thank you for sharing that. I haven't seen that kind of creativity, get a shot to take a shot, since the days I was involved with the Pete's, and that was when I was broadcasting the games back in Roger Nielsen's days. So it goes it goes back away when Bob Ganey was actually playing. So that's how far I go back. But I love it. Get a shot to take a shot. And please, everyone, please listen to that. Get a shot. And if you're a Pete's fan, and if you don't get a shot, you're not going to like the penalty box, I can assure you. So that's it for me. On behalf of Peterborough County, let's everyone please keep our head up. Keep smiling. We're very, very, very lucky to have what we what we have. So let's uh, let's think positively. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Warden Jones. And uh, thanks for sharing your past with the Peets as well. They are a great organization to work with. OK, so now we have a chance to hear from our media partners. Uh, also joining us today, uh, we have Inspector John Lyons from the Peterborough Police Service and Constable Joe Iatt from OPP. So if there are questions for our enforcement partners, um, please, you can ask them as well. Uh, but let's start with uh, Taylor Clysdale from um, Peterborough This Week and MyCawartha.com. If you've got questions for, for our speakers, please go right ahead. Thank you so much, Brittany. Um, yeah, questions for um, Dr. Salvatera today. Um, maybe I can start with a question on back to school. Um, I'm just uh, seeing some comments from people on social media, uh, some parents concerned, saying that they don't feel like the uh, the guidance from the province on back to school is, is in depth enough or is skimpy on the details. Um, do you have any responses to that or any uh, advice or comments that you want to kind of relay to parents that might be concerned about the back to school plans? Well, I agree. It's a very high level document and uh, and, and the details are not there. Um, I have been in conversation with colleagues uh, in the Office of the Chief Medical Officer of Health and with the Ministry, and we do expect to get have uh, accompanying, accompanying documents re uh, released soon. Uh, so we will we will be getting more details as we go forward, uh, and so uh, and I will be sharing that information both with our school board partners, but also with the members of of our community, so that. Uh, we have as much information as we need for a safe re-entry. Okay, yeah, for sure. And um, kind of moving off the uh, back to school topic, um, I haven't been in one of these pressers for a while. And back when I was, uh, last one I covered, I think uh, we were still having three digit numbers. So to see four active cases is actually uh, uh, very impressive. Uh, I do remember last summer we had, I think it was like 30 or 40 days where we didn't have a, a, a single active case. Um, are we kind of predicting that we're going to see a light summer and then kind of ramp back up in the fall, kind of like it did last year, or, or is this where it tapers off? Well, I mean, we can hope. We're five days into uh, into uh, a, a COVID-free summer so far. We did go 40 days last year. It was quite remarkable. I, I don't think we'll see that again, and that's because we're dealing with a much more infectious uh, variant than uh, last summer. And so, but I will take what I can get, Taylor. So uh, I think uh, it's uh, very, it, it is very reassuring to us both the, the reduced number of cases and also the fact that our wastewater surveillance data is also very encouraging right now. And the more people who, that we can get immunized, the, the better it's going to be for all of us and the more hope I will have in that we can actually uh, see uh, many days without any new cases. 
And speaking about uh, vaccinations, what are the barriers that are preventing, you know, uh, that that segment of the population that can get vaccinated uh, and is choosing not to? Like, what are the reasons why they're not getting vaccinated? Well, I think there it depends on the individual. I think we have uh, there will be some people who are not comfortable going to mass immunization clinics, so the setting might be a little uh, intimidating for them or difficult to get to. Uh, there are people who can't make appointments, whether uh, phone or online uh, internet access are issues, or that their lives are just so unpredictable that they aren't able. To, to, to make appointments. So for them, you know, we're providing the walk-in uh, ability. So hopefully that will help many of them. Um, we know that some have uh, concerns or fears. We're hoping that our primary care partners will be able to reach out to their patients, uh, to those who haven't been immunized yet, and to address any of those issues that might be barriers for them. Uh, and then there will be a few uh, for whom, no matter what we do, uh, they have decided not to be immunized. But I do think that's a very small percentage in Peterborough. Uh, and, uh, and I'm hoping that we can find the right way, the right incentives uh, uh, the, to um, help those who uh, are maybe hesitant, but who are open to being immunized. I hope we can make that happen as soon as possible. Okay. And uh, last question here, uh, just about you, actually. Uh, I haven't uh, heard any uh, updates about um, uh, your retirement. Uh, is that still expected to take place closer to the end of the year, or, or what's the time frame looking on that? Uh, I'm hoping that I can um, retire by, before the end of September. And I do know that uh, the board is working very diligently on making that happen. And uh, so I would say stay tuned and hopefully we'll hear something soon. Okay, I think that's it for me. Thank you so much, Dr. Salvatore. I appreciate all the answers today. Thank you very much, Taylor. Okay, so let's uh, hear from Matt Latour from uh, our radio stations, uh, Freak and, and Oldies Radio. If you've got some questions, go right ahead, Matt. Uh, yeah, my questions are for Dr. Salvatera today. Um, I know earlier this morning, Moderna had mentioned that a booster shot may be needed by the winter. Um, my question more has to do with vaccine mixing and then having to get a booster afterwards. Uh, does it matter if you have mixed vaccines and then need a booster or if you're, do you have to be kind of double Moderna before then? No, right now, Matt, um, the, um, we know that the uh, Pfizer and the Moderna are interchangeable, that they are essentially the same vaccine, but with different brand names. And we are treating them as equivalents. And we have good advice, good, strong recommendations from NACI that does support that interchangeability of the two messenger RNA vaccines. And Canada is not alone. There are other jurisdictions where the vaccines have been interchanged. And part of it's dependent on supply, you know, and just on, and no matter how hard our federal colleagues worked to get vaccine to us in time, uh, they were not in control of how quickly those, uh, those um, uh, uh, manufacturers were shipping. So, you know, we, we had to we had to be uh, able to to mix and match, and I certainly did uh, support that. I think uh, the need for a third dose is being studied. Uh, there may we still don't know how long immunity will last from our immunization, whether or not we may need a booster dose in the future, especially for the older population or for those who are immunocompromised. I mean, these messenger RNA vaccines worked tremendously well, even in older populations where typically vaccines are not as effective. So um, it, it was quite remarkable to see how effective these vaccines have been in our older populations. But again, we don't know how long it's going to last. I think we're going to need to keep studying this to see. Uh, and then at some point, uh, there may be a need for a booster. There may be a need if, in fact, we have vaccine escape, we get a variant a vari that it has figured out how to escape the the uh, effect of the vaccine. So there, there are several possible scenarios where I could see more immunization uh, as a possibility, but we are nowhere near that right now. 
Perfect. And MP Monts have answered my second question in the chat. So that's awesome as well. Uh, my last question is actually for Burton. Uh, it just has to do with the um, the new initiative between you two. Is this the, are you guys, the, as far as you know, the first OHL team to do something like this with a local health unit? And are you hoping to maybe set an example in that? Great question, Matt. And thanks for asking it. Yeah, to our knowledge, we're the, the first OHL team to partner with local public health on an initiative like this and sort of dates back a long history of the Pete's trying to be leaders in areas like this and going beyond just the you know the pucks and the sticks. So certainly uh, we, we believe we're the first here. And and to, to expand on that answer, I think it relates back to what the very honorable and I guess very alliter alliterative and he Mary Mons have said. It's all about stepping up for the community and the Pete's take very seriously the have to follow that hockey uh, cliche of playing for the team on the front, not the name lack. We hope that steps up and puts you know, the county and the community of Peterborough first uh, and, and gets their shot. Perfect. That's it for me today. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Matt. And thank you again, Burton. Um, Okay, let's hear from Jessica Nisnik uh, from from Global News. If you've got some questions, please go right ahead, Jessica. Thanks, Brittany. My questions will be for Dr. Salvatera. Dr. Salvatera, um, regarding the Delta variant, you know, we've had quite a few variants come through here. W what is separating it? What is making it, you know, worse than the others? And what happened to the others? <laughs> <laughs> well, what you, you see happening, Jessica, is what happens in, in, in nature, where because of a mutation, uh, it, it provides an advantage. And, you know, one, a, a certain strain or a certain species can crowd out the others and take over. So that's what's happened with Delta. We've seen it go from being, uh, you know, uh, very rare to now being the dominant uh, COVID virus in uh, Ontario, and uh, and it'll it'll keep maintain that dominance because of the fact that it is so easily transmitted, because of the fact that so many vi viral uh, viruses are shed. You get there's a high viral load, so uh, it will uh, it'll it'll actually promote its uh, its uh, dominance because it can so many more will be infected. Uh, unfortunately, it also uh, comes with a little more virulence in that uh, people who are unimmunized will uh, potentially experience more severe illness, uh, risk of hospitalization and ICU admission. I will note though that anyone who is immunized, if you are fully immunized, even if you do uh, get infected with the Delta variant, the vaccine should protect you against hospitalization and severity. So that's some good news as well is that even, you know, uh, um, with it, uh, with, with the vaccine, that it, it, even if it isn't one hundred percent effective, it does provide you with that additional uh, protection against uh, against the, the the nastiness of the uh, Delta variant. Have I answered your question? Yes. Yeah, sorry, I was having trouble getting unmuted. There, you have. Um, do you think that like? Do we any of the four active cases have they been identified as having it? Uh, I don't know if of the four that are still active, we, if any of them are Delta, but of the two that were tested last week by the uh, Public Health Ontario lab, they were both Delta. So in the past week, we've only seen Delta here in Peterborough. We haven't seen any Alpha cases. Do you think you, you remember when this first started, we would say that, you know, for every person that's tested, there are other people out there who have it and aren't tested. Do you think that's still the case? Do you think there's people that just that, you know, I, I can't remember what you used to say about for every like you or know what I'm talking about. It's a, it, that testing was the tip of the iceberg and that it'll always be that for human cases because it relies on the person getting symptoms. And we know that not everyone gets symptoms with uh, COVID-19. There is a symptomatic infection that occurs with this virus. And it also relies on people who have symptoms getting tested. And sometimes we see that, you know, for whatever reason, it's either they, they can't to get time off work or they're afraid to be tested or they don't think it's serious enough to be tested. So, you know, that we miss we miss some of those symptomatic cases and sometimes don't discover them until others have been infected. And then when we go back, we recognize that there had been someone who was symptomatic. So there are reasons why humans 
may not get tested and why relying on human testing data is not doesn't give give a, a, a great degree of confidence. But uh, we now have wastewater surveillance here in Peterborough, not for all of our municipalities. I would like to see wastewater surveillance for every single wastewater treatment uh, facility. Uh, right now we have it only for Peterborough City and for Millbrook. And uh, wastewater, you know, it tastes, it tests the whole population. If you poop, you're contributing. And so um, the, it doesn't have those same biases, uh, that human testing. And it's also earlier. What we find with the wastewater testing is that we're getting the signal three to four days before we would get the case reported to us. So I would, uh, I'm feeling more confident because of the fact that we have wastewater surveillance. And, uh, and I, as I said, I would like to have more of it. I think we need more of it in order to, uh, in the future, uh, have a better sense of how much transmission is going on in our community. Okay. Um, and, and lastly, just to, you've mentioned these stats before about the Delta versus, you know, the, the regular COVID strain and how much more um, deadly it is or contractable it is. Do you, do you remember those numbers? Yes, I, I shared today that uh, it's twice as infectious uh, and that its reproductive uh, uh, value is seven. So that means that for every one person who's infected, they will infect another seven people. And we see that in our households. When you look at how many of our high-risk contacts go on to develop COVID, if they're a household member of a case, they have a right now uh, a, a over 50% chance of, of getting sick. So, um, so that's the Delta. And, uh, and that's uh, one of the reasons why we need immunization to help uh, blunt that, uh, that transmission and prevent it. The fewer susceptible people you have in the community, the fewer people the virus can infect. And so immunization will be our greatest defense against the Delta variant. Okay, thank you. That leads me to my next question. We are, um, what if we don't get to 90%? I know that's a goal. And um, and then I think every you said every health unit has to reach 70 and the, the overall. What if we don't, we are past that already, so we're okay for the health unit. But what if the province doesn't get to 90? Will we just keep waiting and offering more incentives until the laggers catch up? How, how is that going to work? Do you well, know? I, I think we'll still, thanks to our federal uh, 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 government, we have vaccines. So we are in this uh, amazingly privileged place that everyone can have a vaccine. Uh, and so uh, what we will do, I, what I, I, I uh, expect we will do is that we will continue to rely on our pharmacies in Peterborough. And, you know, I walked into one of our pharmacies this past week and the pharmacist there told me that they were almost at 2000 people that they had immunized themselves at that one pharmacy. So we'll rely on our pharmacies, we'll rely on our physicians and nurse practitioners to uh, take advantage of someone who may be in the office, who hasn't had their shot, and who might decide that, yeah, okay, uh, I I'm ready now. So we'll, we'll rely very heavily on pharmacies and, and primary care to continue to immunize to get us to that 90%. I fully expect as well that once uh, pediatric uh, immunizations have been authorized in Canada, that public health might step into that again. We may set up clinics like we did for the community, but targeting them at our school populations, at families who are uh, will then be able to come in and have their little ones immunized. So I think public health will continue to play a role. Uh, I think uh, other partners will, uh, will step up and play a bigger role and that hopefully eventually and not in the not in the not not too distant future, we'll get to that 90%. Okay. Um, that's it for me. Thanks. I I guess I, I wonder whether the government will actually stick to it. Like they say the 21 days and then they go sooner. I don't know. I guess we'll wait and see if, if they drop that 90%, like they tend to drop things. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Salvatero. Thank you very much, Jessica.
Okay, I'd like to invite our colleagues from the Peterborough Examiner to ask their questions. Uh, let's start with Joelle Kovach. If you've got questions, go ahead. Yep, sorry about that. Had to get myself unmuted. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Salvatera, I, I just want to make sure I, I understood the correct figure that you offered a little while ago. Did you say 1,300? No, 13,800 people are still eligible for a vaccine? I'm just checking, uh, Joelle. Yes, I did. 13,800. Oh, good. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that I understood that and heard it correctly. Okay. Um, regarding back to school, um, will uh, Peterborough Public Health be publishing vaccination rates for various schools in, 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 in the future? Like, I know that some health units are doing so in order to offer transparency to parents and, and students, about, particularly in high schools. I just wonder if that's something that uh, has been considered, whether it's an idea that'll be adopted locally. So first, I think I want to start with a caution, Joelle, and that is that our COVAX uh, database for immunization, which is a great database, is not so great on identifying which school a student attends. So that, that part, that data that's been collected is often missing or it's inaccurate. So I have to uh, I have to raise an issue with the quality of the data. Uh, and so that if it is being reported, uh, that it needs to be taken with a grain of salt. Currently here in Peterborough, we are not planning on, on attempting that. Um, and we will need immunization data on individuals as part of our management of cases and contacts in schools. But we are not looking at uh, publishing immunization rates by school. Okay, so if children uh, aren't immunized for something else, say measles, mumps, rubella, I will get uh, a reminder letter from you to say, hey, you have a deadline to do this or else your child will be, won't be able to attend school anymore. Is that something that's going to happen with, with this vaccine? Is that going to be added to the list? Well, so you're talking about the Immunization of School Pupils Act, and there are a number of vaccines that are mandatory for in order for students to attend school. And, uh, and uh, we have certainly many medical officers of health have been requesting that the province uh, amend the act and include COVID-19 as one of those mandatory vaccines. And the province hasn't chosen to do that as yet. So it will not be part of of that uh, Immunization of School Pupils Act, um, but we'll do everything we can to encourage uh, families and students and staff to get immunized. I mean, the benefits of being fully immunized and being back in the classroom far outweigh the any risk uh, from the vaccine. Oh, yeah. What do you think? Do you think it should be added to that list of mandatory vaccines? Did you speak up? Uh, about that, or uh, personally, uh, I, I personally feel that it it should be added. That it would be uh, that it, it that it could be included, and it, it makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, but I recognize that I am only one one perspective and one opinion, and that uh, that there isn't consensus there yet. Okay, that's really helpful. Thanks very much, as usual. I think that's all I have today. Okay, thank you, Joelle. Uh, okay, uh, so Reg Watson, any follow up questions um, for Dr. Salvatera or our other speakers today? Go ahead. Uh, no, thanks this week. Okay, well, I think then we have uh, heard from all of our media partners. And uh, so I would like to just take a moment to thank um, everybody who's, who's joined us today. Thank you. Oh, Jessica has a follow up question, I see. So, Jessica, go ahead. Thanks. Sorry, Brittany. Dr. Salvatera, just following up on, on Joelle's question, mm. if, what does a vaccine, like, why wouldn't it be on there already? Like, if, what qualified the other vaccines to be part of that, that act? Uh, well, that's a really good question, Jessica. I think where I've heard some concern is that the fact that the uh, author, that they are new vaccines and just recently authorized. I know, for example, when we had the H1N1 
epidemic or pandemic that as well, uh, that was not made mandatory in recognition that it was a new vaccine and some people had concerns. Um, but I must say, and, and, I, and thank you for asking the question, because I did want to add in response to Joelle's remark uh, or question that I know of families who are keeping their children home this year uh, for virtual learning because of the risk of COVID-19 to the family, because they have household members who are immunocompromised uh, or children who are immunocompromised. And because uh, they cannot be sure that their child will be in, a, in an environment where everyone is immunized, they are making the decision to keep their children at home. And to me, that I, I just find that so regrettable. Uh, that some children are not going to be able to benefit from in-classroom learning. And I, I just wanted to add that as one more reason why um, it makes sense to have uh, COVID-19 immunization mandatory for staff and students uh, in schools, just so that, because these are universal services, we want everyone to partake. And unless we can make them as safe as possible for our more vulnerable students and staff, then there will be those who cannot go to school. And that's a real shame. Just to ask one more question on that then, Dr. Salvatera, how quickly could it be added? Does it have to pass through a bunch of things? Can it just be, can can the education I, minister just say, I, here it is, it's added? I believe, and I believe, Jessica, that it's a, that it's a regular, it's in regulation and not in legislation. So one of the regulations of the act, and that does not, that can be done uh, through ministerial approval, uh, only requires ministerial approval. So it, it can be a, a rapid fix. Okay, that is officially it for me. Thanks, Dr. Okay. Salvatera. Thanks, Brittany. Okay, thank you very much, Jessica. Okay, well, um, as we uh, approach the one o'clock mark, I think that means we're finished and we've got, uh, we've heard from everybody. So thank you again to our guests. Thank you again to um, Burton Lee joining us from Peterborough Peets and sharing the good news about the partnership. So please keep an eye open out there uh, if you've not been dosed yet to um, join the contest and win a chance to take part in uh, that wonderful um, uh, contest. And we look forward to seeing you back here next Tuesday, sorry, next Thursday at 12 noon. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Brittany. Thanks, Brittany.